it, you know it's other stuff but similarly that is you're an asset isn't it yeah you're an asset yes you are an asset <laughs> Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We're here for another episode of the Big Idea Podcast, where as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without working harder. So without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Never mind. Just going to check the uh, light switches. That's it. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Oh dear. Anyway, we haven't got a lot of time, so we're no, going to be straight very on. Quick. We've got a very quick um, agenda to take. I see Mark, Claire, and Jason watching, so that's good. Cool. Yes, welcome everybody to the April edition of the Big Idea Podcast. It's Easter. Easter's here, isn't it? Just about, yes, absolutely. And I thought, as it's Easter, we'd talk today about hot cross buns. Why not? Uh, well, because oh, you're not looking for an actual reason why not. No, no, I think why not's a great idea. Yeah. Well, the reason this that I came about about this, and I thought, right, hot cross buns, it's a hot topic. But um, it's that was my lunch today, and I've kind you of hot been, cross bun for lunch. Uh, no, I didn't just have any hot cross bun. Not just any hot cross bun. Uh, as you might be able to see the remnants of my plate here, if I show the that's the live camera videos. That's not the a, live camera's up there. I'm up there. <laughs> that's not just. <laughs> Did you, did you toast it along the egg, cream egg or something? Did you? Inside? Well, it's, it's, it is rather a sweet hot cross bun. Mm-hmm. So it's a salted caramel and dark chocolate hot cross bun. Just so taking a moment to sink that in there. That was a salted caramel. Yeah. And dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. So in a hot cross bun? Yes. Yes. So there's, no, there's nothing savoury in there at all. There's no fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no cinnamon. Um, it's basically, it's a bun... It's a bap. Which it's a bap with <laughs> like hunks of salted caramel, which just melt and it's very delicious. And and the chocolate chips go a little bit melty, and then you just add some butter to it. Really nice. Anyway, that's I'm not here to sell you on salted caramel hot cross buns. What I want to talk about is having a spin off product. Mm-hmm. So we've all known about hot cross buns for years and years and years, and they've always been the same. They are. You know, they've got fruit in them, they've got cinnamon. Bit cross on top. Yeah, bit, bit cross. Maybe they're a different size. Maybe they are. Well, I remember one year they saw square hot cross buns. Oh my God, how, in, how innovative is that? What people have done now is, is actually created these little spin offs and say, okay, people like the idea of a hot cross bun. It's Easter, let's have a hot cross bun. But I don't like fruit. And this, I know some people like this, I don't like fruit, so I don't eat hot cross buns. I know, let's create a sweet version. Let's stick salted caramel and chocolate in it. Oh, that's great, isn't it? Yeah. And you do it with eggs as well, because it used to be just the cream egg, didn't it? Yeah. You're going to get cream egg over here, and then you have a galaxy egg, and you have a yeah. Malteser egg, and you have a, all these other eggs that have just appeared, because, yeah, as you say, you can spin off. It's like, take something that works, and, uh, yeah. And it's, it's looking at the objections and saying, okay, why wouldn't you buy this product? Okay, I wouldn't buy the product because I don't like fruit. I don't like one of the main ingredients of this product. No problem, sir. Let me just create a brand new product for you. <laughs> which has got something a little bit different in it. So oh, I can eat that, gluten-free. Okay. Gluten-free, hot cross buns, there you go. Um, what about a high-end one? So, you know, I was in Waitrose the other day, and they've got, like, um, cherry and, I don't know, avocado. <laughs> so hot cross buns. <laughs> Maybe not avocado <laughs> in a hot cross bun, but it was, it was cherry and something. A cherry and um, blood orange. Oh, right, okay. And it was like really, really nice. But it's like, again, someone would say, oh, I don't want a hot sponge because they're too basic for me. They're too, yeah, I want something that's nice and high end. But okay, there you go. Cherry and blood orange or avocado if someone's gone very, very wrong with the bias. Actually, use avocado butter or something. You could do. You could just smash an avocado, <laughs> put it on top, bit of almond butter. But yes. Um, kids' versions. So again, I mean, my kids do tend to like a traditional hot cross bun, but a lot of kids don't. Again, it's got fruit in it. So, all right, let's create more of a small, more bun-like hot cross bun. This is one product that, you know, when I was a kid, you had hot cross buns and they were, well, that was it. It was a hot cross bun, wasn't it? Mm, Now, all of a sudden, you've got a choice of 30 to 40 different types of hot cross bun, the best of which are definitely the salted caramel and chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's say where you got it from uh, I've actually got them several different places oh have you yeah, yeah. Uh, Tesco Finest very nice oh right okay um, 
Where else did we get them from? I think we got them from the local bakery, and they were, they were very nice. Oh, OK. Yes. Mm. Got one left, I might have to have another one. I thought you were saving it for me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> tricky, tricky. But I, I just want people to kind of think about their own business and about mm-hmm. what products they may have in there. And people who would t- have perhaps said to you, I'm not going to buy your product because I don't like one of the main ingredients, I don't like the size of it, I don't like the shape of it, uh, my kids won't eat it, you know, I don't interact with it, it's wrong for me. How can you tweak it and just create a spin off version? of that product that is for exactly for the people who wouldn't buy your main product so you know um, yeah let's let's look at easter eggs and say well actually I don't I don't like milk chocolate okay we're going to make you a white chocolate easter egg okay um, you know we're going to make you a dark chocolate easter egg we're going to make you a I'm getting hungry now <laughs> I'm going to say can we stop talking about food <laughs> <laughs> But it is Easter, so we can get away with it. That's good. Yes. You say you've got the big ones, hollow ones. Loads of it, isn't it? That's some um, as big as your head. That's some as big as your head. But it doesn't have to apply just to food. It could be any product range, couldn't it? Yes. It doesn't have to be just, just those. You know, we don't like red roses, so here's a nice multicoloured one. I saw the other day, there's these yeah, literally multicoloured petals on the rose kind of thing. And it's like, how on earth do you spray them that colour? But it looked really good and really yeah. effective. But again, it's like, you know, the reds are a bit boring. So we've done that. Let, let's do something different, you know. I think it's because the manure is from horse, yeah, from unicorns. I think that's what it was. Bobbing um, the horse manure on the races, but who knows what it was? But they, you know, they look really good, and really different, and, and obviously stood out. So it is just, um, yeah, have a look at what you've got and how can you adapt them to suit more people necessarily, but also ah, oh, it's just something completely different, something completely out there, something yeah. completely radical, a bit innovative, and um, you know, taking the the normal product and making it better. Yeah. Have you read the book of the month? This nope. month? No. No, when you said Gerald Ratner, I thought, oh, that doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Didn't really inspire me, to be honest. Didn't inspire you. So he built up like a £150 million empire. I know he did. Owned the high street. He and did. Threw it all away with one Threw it all away with one comment. You see, I don't want to, I don't, wanna, I don't want to be that person, mate. Yeah. I don't want to be the person to make one throwaway comment and it kind of cost but me everything. But the thing everything. is, I mean, having read, I have read the book. Very interesting book. Um, I guess I was going to hopefully get that from you. To yeah, I'd, like I'd that. seen Gerald Ratner speak before, and he's a very, very interesting guy, brilliant after dinner speaker. It wasn't a throwaway comment. This was a speech that he'd given four or five times before. Um, he told those exact jokes every single time. Um, on the day of the speech, he ran it past his like PR agency. Yeah, that's great. Put the joke in there about it being crap. They love that. Oh, okay, I'll do that. Um, he ran it past um, his chief executive. That sounds good, Joe. They like it when you tell the, the jokes and stories. You're very funny. You're very good at that. He ran it past about five different people. Not one of them said, I wouldn't say that if I were you. <laughs> they all went, that's really good, Joe. I, I think you'll love that. The audience at the event went, oh, that's really nice. So funny. Yeah, the jokes were brilliant. And then there was one reporter there from the Daily Mirror who had an agenda who said, actually, I don't think that's right. I think you're taking the mick out of your customers. Um, I'm, I'm going to report this in, in the paper. And that was how it all blew up from there. Um, uh, are those same kind of people that you hear around the comments through, the ones that look after our politicians' comments and speeches? <laughs> <laughs> they all seem to not realise what point what they're saying and how it can be misinterpreted by different areas of the press. I think they could be. But it, <laughs> it's very interesting to see, actually, that the press just thought, well, we're going to have you. Mm-hmm. And it was just literally, they'd built him up. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, we're laughing. And we're, we're going to hound you because there's a movement here. And there's you know, the sentiment here that sells newspapers. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, always remembering that that is the newspaper owner's job is to sell newspapers. Um, I was watching something last week. Um, it was all about the Facebook. No, it, was, it wasn't about the Facebook. I think it was about the blue passports. Um, there's outrage. Actually, we were, we were talking about this last week while I was recording the audiobook about the media in general and mm. the language that is used by the media and it's words like fury, outrage. Like most people, we're British, we don't really have fury and outrage. We get a bit miffed at things. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit miffed. But by the time it's been turned into a newspaper headline, all of a sudden, yeah, I'm a bit miffed about that, is I'm furious. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe it. So there's been fury that... Um, the blue passports, um, now that we're exiting the EU, apparently there's a thing called Brexit. I've not heard much about this. I don't know about you, whether you've heard anything about this. I'm not paying an awful lot of attention to it, to be honest with you. No, no. haven't seen it mentioned anywhere before. 
Uh, but we're getting blue passports and they can be made in France. France, you can't say it without saying it in the Al Murray voice again. France! France. <laughs> um, and there's, there's outrage about this. And the Daily Mail apparently had a headline along the lines of, why do you hate this country? Um, why, you know, how can you um, make this decision that's going to cause the UK economy to be in such deprivation by making it in France? And then apparently someone said, well, why is the Daily Mail owner living in France and avoiding tax in the UK and therefore costing the UK economy all this money? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Glass houses, stones is absolutely fine. And needless to say that the French company came in £120 million cheaper. So they were cheaper. The more effective. Yes. In a sealed bid where the, the people sealed making bid. decisions didn't know which country they were from or anything like that. So there was no prejudice there towards anyone in particular see and also I don't understand and, I, and you might be able to shed some light on it because I've not really read it on it to be fair but why are we buying for £120 million cheaper well, how, so it must be quite considerable the cost for it but why are we buying their services when they are selling us passports mm. I don't understand how that tender works <laughs> and if we're if the government are buying it so why have we then got to, you know do hundred odd pounds for a passport nowadays well exactly this is a good question but yeah. that's not what this is about is it yeah. no absolutely so he was uh, he it's rose it's all about being a bit he fell and then he rose again so oh yes tell us about no, I just wrote it. <laughs> tell us about his rise yes. <laughs> so the rise actually the rise is I think the real story behind the book because mm-hmm. alright the, the audio book was about seven or eight hours I think mm, yeah, the, the majority of that focuses on growing Ratner's pre the speech mm-hmm. a little bit about what went wrong and then a lot about what happened afterwards um, and it's very interesting to see that he still had it he still knew what he wanted to actually do uh, he knew what to do to get it back so it was like they took away all of his money they took away his reputation mm. his reputation was absolutely shot Mm. Um, what they couldn't take away was the knowledge between his ears mm-hmm. and he's like well I know how to make money I know how to raise capital I know how to create products that the great British public want to buy and I can put all that together and I can make it happen um, there's a couple of ways in which he did that the one I liked the best was he created this health club and he went he, you know this was late 90s I would say so you know there wasn't the, the big health movement that we've got now but he went in and said right okay let's create this health club and it's going to cost several million pounds to build I don't have any money because <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. it's all been taken off me I don't have my reputation I, you know, I can't really go if I go to the bank and say um, yeah I'd like to borrow two million pounds three million pounds please they're going to say yes and what's the name is Ratner Ratner Oh, that rings a bell. You're not any relation to that Gerald, that crap guy. Yeah, yeah, that, that's me. Oh, is it? Yeah. So what he did, he, he partnered up with someone who basically got all the plans made up for this, this health club. And he got an architect to draw up plans for it. He then took out full page adverts in the local newspaper saying, um, we're going to have this new health club. It's launching uh, nine months from now. Uh, if you'd like to be a founder member of this then give us a ring obviously it's pre-internet days but give us a ring and give us your bank details and we'll get the direct debit set up for you ready to go as soon as we launch the price is going to be £400 a year Mm -hmm. so what he did there was he spent all his money on that newspaper ad and the architect design if nobody had signed up he would have then abandoned that idea having lost 20 grand 25 grand yeah what actually happened was about 2,000 people set up a direct debit for £400 a year which he was then able to go to the bank and say I've got direct debits here for £800,000 a year can I borrow £2 million please to build this health club mm-hmm. because if I build it I've got orders here I've got orders and not like, yeah, I'll give you some money. I've actually got their direct debits signed, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All we've got to know is build the bloody thing. Yep. Um, but interestingly, even then, even with that, bank after bank said, what's the name on the application? Ratner, Ratner, Ratner. Mm, no, we're not going to We're not going to need a company that gives a couple of million Give pounds to life. Gerald Ratner. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually he, he went in and... Um, 
think it was a similar story actually we had from um, Neville last month but we went into his local Nat West and this was like last chance saloon he thought well there's no way if I've not got it from Coots and I've not got it from the investment arm of Barclays there is no way I'm going to walk into my local Nat West and get the money so anyway it goes into the local Nat West here's the business plan um, yeah I've got £800,000 worth of direct debits all set up ready to go um, there's the architect drawings this is where it's going to be it's all great and um, I'd like £2 million please the bank manager says, yep, certainly Mr. Ratner. Um, if you could just sign documents there. That... Sorry? <laughs> I said, um, well, yes, it's, it's all, all been approved. Oh. He said, why, why have you been able to let me do that when the, you know, the massive corporate branch is done? And he said, well, it's a very simple reason, really, Mr. Ratner. Um, of those 2,000 um, direct debit forms you've got there, one of them belongs to my wife. And she will not be very happy if she doesn't get to go to this health club. So you've got a right mind rather set on it. <laughs> <laughs> not what he's expecting at all. Then. But it's just very interesting to see that he completely capped the downside. Mm-hmm. And he just got this minimum viable product out there, which was literally a drawing of this multi-million pound health club. And if people, if the market like it, I'll build the thing. If they don't, I'm not I've cut my losses and I've lost 25 grand Mm -hmm. he always capped the downside whether that was even when he was growing Ratners back in the like late 80s early 90s and he would ring up um, so say he wanted to go into Carlisle and he was thinking about opening a shop in Carlisle he'd ring up H. Samuel in Carlisle and say oh hi uh, it's head office here Uh, yeah I don't seem to have your figures for last week Um, I've got 13,000 oh no it should be more than that Mm -hmm. no we did 16 and a half thousand oh yes oh that's right yes no worries thank you didn't tell him he was head office that was ringing that on. <laughs> Excellent. But he just always, always was looking to cap the downside. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, the audio version wasn't as good as the written one, I think. Um, normally, I'd love it when the author reads the audio book. Obviously, I've read my own audio book now. Um, but with Gerald Ratner, I think, he, I think he perhaps struggled to actually read it and get that passion across that I know he's got because I've seen him to talk live I've seen some of these stories brought to life already and it just for me didn't quite have it on that audiobook it's about robotic yeah but there's lots of lessons there I think and because I I know I've talked to a few people and I had the same feeling that actually didn't really warm to him in the early days because there was a lot of well I think the first time he mentioned money was oh and the company is worth 14 million at this point oh okay so we're starting with a net worth of 14 million are we okay <laughs> right. um, and there was lots of he lived a very very affluent playboy style lifestyle and that doesn't necessarily represent what we stand for with the ambitious lifestyle business but I think by the end of it it does because I think once he's had the the downs and the fall I think he was much more appreciative of what money does for you I mean I think you know, it cost him his marriage the first time around. Mm-hmm. Um, cost him his name. Literally, he can't trade as Ratners. Um, cost him his reputation. Now he runs an online venture, selling jewelry online still. Um, he's got his reputation back. He's rebuilt that. He's now he now works from home. You know, to his office is now a back bedroom, mm-hmm. and you know, he doesn't waste money on lavish champagne lifestyles and penthouse apartments. It's all now. Well, I can spend some money on AdWords. I can bring in some sales for that. And it's it's very interesting. To see. I think he's, I personally think he's gone full circle. Um, you know, he's now a very wealthy man. No one as rich as he was uh, at his height in the nineties and or you know late eighties, early nineties. But he's a very wealthy man, and I think a, a happier man than he was then. It'd be interesting to see actually. You know, where would he be now if he hadn't have given that speech or if the press had just accepted that it was just a joke. Welcome to the video. We're on the Big <laughs> Idea Podcast. <laughs> cool. I think this might be an audio version this month only. It's a, it's a good audio. It's a special... So you were talking about uh, you, you've read your audio book. Yes. So last week... I can't week. believe I still didn't get the call up or even got to audition to read your book for you. I know. I, I think, think I would have done it a lot better. To be well, fair. do you know what? We, we did talk about it because at the very end of the recording, so I've recorded the main bulk of the book, and then the producer said to me, Right, okay, they normally want some kind of intro, outro, they want the top and tail stuff. Mm. Let's just, you know, they haven't given us any instructions, they haven't given us a script of what they want you to say, so let's just do some, um, you know, uh, what's it called? 
WF House Limited presents Big Ideas for Small Businesses. Um, this has been an audible production of blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, this was read and written and read by the author, narrated by the author. Like, do all that, great. Mm. And he said, well, if they want something else, he said, then we're going to have to get someone else in to actually record it. And I said, well, that's okay. Let, let's have a look at who. Yeah. So I said, let's look at another one that's been done by the same publisher. Let's see what sort of intro and outro they've got. And I was like, okay. Couldn't really ascertain that a set formula they wanted. And I said, well, it's okay. I said, there's one here. I said, and it's the same publisher, so they must have this uh, narrator on hand. Uh, I'll get him to do it. It's Brian Blessed. Oh, you've not quite in my head. I was just about to do an impression. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to do that impression. I'm just like, of all the people I would want to introduce or outro my audio it, it would be Brian Blessed I was going to do that <laughs> darn it he totally stood my face. it was here in my head it's just like how can he get his out of it deep, deep voice and go on then I'm not give, it, it give us your breath uh, I'm not doing it you spoil it go on no <laughs> go on so this uh, audio book then came well, out of writing a book it did so I, what big was, ideas for small businesses it did yeah so that was the book we wrote we wrote I wrote last year yeah. Um, and it's interesting I, I like to think in terms of assets now mm-hmm. so what assets do we create and we you know so that is my only job now is to build buy create and sweat assets and that audiobook is now just another asset so I spent two days last week in the studio creating a brand new asset that didn't exist but that now that can be earning us money whilst we sleep for the rest of our lives. You know, 25 years from now, people can still pick up that audiobook. Mm-hmm. And every time someone buys that audiobook, we're going to get a royalty. That is, you know, one-time work, ongoing um, royalties. That is, that is the perfect asset. But that also brings then people into our world mm-hmm. and provides potential leads for us. Again, fantastic asset. And it got me thinking then that, because again, there's a chapter in the book where I talk a lot about asset creation and what sort of things you can do. And it it dawned on me that actually that's all I did last week was create assets. I spent the entire week either building, buying, creating, or sweating existing assets. So I wrote down what we did last week. So two days in the studio doing an audio book. We went through and improved the user experience on one of our websites so we literally went through this is a website that gets I don't know what 200,000 people a month going through it no, it's not a good one to be honest but yeah that's now all of a sudden we've done some user experience stuff which all right, might increase the conversion rate by 0.7% but you multiply that by 200,000 people you know 2.4 million a year going through that website that's sweating an existing asset. The asset was already there, it already exists, it already works, but let's sweat it, let's actually improve that, let's tweak that a little bit, and let's see if we can get an extra 2% of people that land on the landing page giving us their email address. Let's get an extra one out of every seven of those people to take our first tripwire upsell. I prefer to think of myself as informative. Remember, knowledge is half the battle. Cheers, Alexa. Where were we? <laughs> knowledge is half the battle. Knowledge is half the battle, it is. <laughs> By listening to our podcast, you get a bit of the knowledge. So you, are, you already you did half your battle. Um, Letting us do the sweating for you. Yeah, so we're sweating that exact existing asset. Uh, we then also created an asset what, about three years ago, which was our big uh, Cheltenham Festival um, lead generation campaign. Mm-hmm. So that is an asset we dust it off every year and we do it again but I did a debrief for that so we did the big campaign started it in February ran up and it kind of ran up to its natural conclusion uh, the week before last with obviously the Chapman Festival's Go Cup Day so last week we did a debrief of okay what's worked what hasn't worked what's changed from the last time we did this last time we deployed this asset mm-hmm. um, because now the plan is where we're going to deploy this asset again in June when it's Royal Ascot or it's the, the Derby we'll just dust that asset off again and we'll just say right we're going to deploy it again only this time we'll do something a little bit differently because this side of business 
didn't work quite as well or this side of business was amazing and we, we had great success here let's replicate that mm-hmm. um, we created or started creating a brand new website for a new business last week as well so it's kind of all right, it was a lot of writing copy it was a lot of conversations with techies and with designers so it's not just me sat there creating a website but it's me sitting there creating an asset that asset is going to be a website that basically this business is going to use to win business to get people aware of what they do and actually close them into a sale within you know within an automated period of time that is an asset that we create it now and yet we may well come back and revisit that but we've put the work in now whereby all right, we're probably going to take a month to six weeks to create and build this asset, then we own it. That asset will be earning us money onwards and onwards. And it's just thinking of yourself as an asset manager, I think. You might think of yourself now as a self-employed person or a business owner. How can you consider yourself an asset owner? What assets do you own? What assets do you control? And what assets can you improve? How can you buy a new asset? How can you create a new asset we just come off a coaching call haven't we with our 1% clients and we were talking about creating a brand new product uh, on a monthly direct debit um, procedure and it's like actually that's an asset you've just created a brand new asset the business already exists the customers already exist they're already buying the products but let's plug in a brand new asset which is this brand new service plan and that's going to earn you an extra £240 a year and if you've got 500 customers there you go that's an extra £120,000 a year almost straight on your bottom line there's all right there's some margin involved there but predominantly you're going to add nearly six figures to your bottom line just by taking an existing customer base which is an asset an existing business which is an asset and plugging or creating a brand new asset in there you could buy a complementary business and plug it in you could buy you know if you've got a hot cross bun business Yep, well, I was just going to okay, <laughs> mention yeah, tweaking it a little yeah. bit. You know? How can you buy it? You increase your rate. Create a new <laughs> recipe. A recipe. You could buy an existing brand of hot cross bun. You could do a joint venture with someone else that does savoury and you do sweet. There's scope to expand your asset base without diluting what you sell to your main customers. Mm-hmm. And what other things could be assets? You know, you're looking at leaflets. Maybe you do a successful leaflet. That's an asset you can turn out once, twice, three times a year, if not yeah. more often. You may have an offer that's an asset, to be fair. Um, actually, this offer works really well, so let's let's put that back out again. Let's let's do that. Let's just reuse it. It's keeping it's stuff that you can reuse, and reuse, and reuse to keep the money coming in, keep yeah. the customers coming in, and that sort of stuff, isn't it? So there's lots of different things that can be assets, um, not just those big houses and cars and stuff that you would ordinarily yeah. yeah. think were assets or well, again, you know, it, wine collection under the house or whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, it's other stuff, but similarly, that is, you're an asset, isn't it? Yeah, you're an asset, yeah. You are an asset. <laughs> asset! <laughs> asset! <laughs> yeah, so assets, fantastic idea to uh, to create those and, yeah, keep, keep them going. And I like the idea of sweating them as well, it's actually is making them work for you, making them work harder, yeah. making them sweat um, in order to get, yeah, squeeze every little ounce of, of value out of, of that asset. Um, once you've created them, they're there forever, aren't they? They're, they're sat there waiting for you to use them again. Yeah. Which is, which is good. Absolutely. Which is very good. It is very good. So, yeah, uh, hopefully, guys, the audiobook of Big Ideas for Small Businesses will be available. Uh, obviously, we're recording this start of April, so I would hope by the end of May, beginning of June, it should be live on Audible. All right. Okay. For you to yeah to listen and download. It's a brand new asset that you can go out and, uh, and download for us. Sweet as. Cool. Have a great month guys we will speak to you uh, next month for the May edition of the Big Audio Podcast believe it or not it'll be next month that would yeah I think we're going to go traditional and we are going to say actually we're going to have May following April okay cool after Easter sounds good to me <laughs> okay <lovely. laughs> have a great one guys thanks see you later. take care everyone take bye. care bye so there we are another episode in the can um, how was it for you please let us know um, how do you listen to these podcasts Uh, please leave a review on that platform let us know what we can do better what you like what you don't like and how we can improve to make this show even better for you we'll see you next time